Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. So, we continue with our lectures on traditions in world cinema. I will be talking about Louis Binel, the great film director from Spain and uh, yeah, so uh, the focus is on Spanish cinema. Let me write that on the board, I have not written it. We are going to talk about traditions in Spanish cinema. So, uh, keywords would be Louis Bunel, uh, surrealism, which is a, a, a device, a theory, we will be talking about it. It is a literary uh, concept and a term, and how people like Bunel utilized it. We will also talk about Bunel's collaboration with the great artist Salvador Deli, who was a supreme surrealist. We will later go on to talk about the new Spanish cinema, the contemporary greats in the world of Spanish cinema. Now, um, before I start, I would like you to watch this clipping. Now, due to copyright reasons, I would not be able to show you the exact or the complete scene, but please focus on the link, this particular link. It is a, a scene from um, Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound and it has a scene which is called Dreams Designed by Delhi, Dreams Designed by Salvador Delhi. So, while talking about Bunal, we will also be talking about Surrealism and Salvador Delhi. Therefore, the importance of this particular scene. So, please watch the scene and I will get back to it. I would not be able to show, show you the scene, but please do that on your own. All right. Okay, so, what did you watch in that scene? Uh, plenty of eyes. Gregory Peck, the great Hollywood star and Ingrid Bergman. So, and you watched Gregory Peck being hypnotized, he is um, on a psychiatrist's couch, he is being hypnotized and what does he see? Eyes all over and this was a dream sequence designed by Salvador Deli. Notice his preoccupation with eyes with human parts, bodies and at certain times even the grotesqueness of bodies. What do eyes suggest? Is it a, the eye of the camera? Is it the human eye or eye of the subconscious? Okay. So, Spellbound was a movie that owed a lot to Hitchcock's or the studio's understanding of Freud's theory of psychoanalysis and that is what the story is all about. And this is what, this is one aspect that Bunel and Delhi, the two modernists were interested in. So, we have been talking about cinema as a modern art and these were the modernists. Okay. So, psychoanalysis was a key element of this period and this is what we are interested in. Um, so, um, uh, uh, one of the earliest surrealistic films was The Seashell and the Clergyman. It was written by um, Antonin Artaud, the man who gave us the concept of theatre of the absurd and directed by Germain Dulac, released in 1928. So, surrealism has always been an integral part of cinema. Even today, now and then, we have the concept of dreams and dreams within dreams. Uh, devices used by filmmakers in order to show that there is a, uh, a thin line between what is real and what is subconscious and which and what is dream. So, um, for decades 
as you know we have been talking about uh, surrealism, Spanish cinema. So, Liu Binel at the forefront of Spanish cinema and for decades Spanish cinema was associated with the work of Liu Binel who lived between 1900 to 1983. He made a very bitter caustic documentary called La Herds in 1932, uh, 1932 and uh, after that he was forced to go into exile to various parts of Europe. He did not direct another film for a staggering 15 years. He worked sporadically um, as a producer in Paris, Hollywood and Madrid before emigrating to America in 1938 to escape fascism. A famous quote attributed to Bunel is, thank God I am an atheist. Now, look at the juxtaposition, look at the contradictoriness of the, uh, of the statement, thank God I am an atheist. Bunal was born in Spain and he is regarded as one of the most iconoclastic and rebellious of directors. Um, he has a very savage and macabre and rather cynical view of mankind. He was an enemy of General Franco's Spain, okay, as I have already told you, he was forced to live in exile uh, in Mexico. He, his work reveal his commitment towards anti-fascism, anti-clericalism and anti-bourgeoisism. Okay. So, these tendencies, okay, he was extremely against them, his works illustrate that. He was a surrealist and what is surrealism? Surrealism was a confrontational and experimental art form which is a 20th century avant-garde movement in art and literature. Um, it attempted to revise the existing definitions of reality and to release the creative potential of the unconscious mind by the irrational juxtaposition of images. So, unconscious mind, juxtaposition of images, you know contradictory images that do not go together. We will be talking about that in a moment. Uh, the founder, the founding father of this movement is uh, the poet and artist André Breton, um, who published the first surrealist manifesto, which was a critique of excessive um, rationalism and materialism of western society and sought to reveal the creative potential of the unconscious and juxtaposed images of the real and imagined and the imagined to very disturbing, disconcerting effects. The surrealists were concerned with creating the marvelous, the marvelous aspect of the human mind and they juxtaposed unrelated words and objects concerned and were concerned with definition and perception of reality, what is real, what is unreal, what is subconscious and were also preoccupied with the insights of the subconscious. Now, um, uh, Salvador, coming to uh, Salvador Dali, who is one of the master artists of this period, Dali lived between 1904 to and 1989 and collaborated with Louis Binel on films such as Ashia and the Law. Now, this is a very famous, very well known movie. Um, it was uh, their attempt, Dali and Bunel's attempt to explore subjectivity, the dream subjectivity as seen in dream states and was concerned with subverting the logic of representation. Delhi has also created uh, an artistic work, a painting called dream caused by the flight of a bee around a pomegranate um, a second before awakening, which uh, has symbols of fertility, Virgin Mary, resurrection. So, we have been talking about how anti clerical and anti fascist and uh, how iconoclastic these people were. If you watch, if, if you look at the painting, and I suggest you do it, it is a 1944 painting, and it will tell you how various images, contrasting images, are juxtaposed here in order to reveal. Uh, the workings of a subconscious or the unconscious. Okay. Dali's interest in dreamscape and the influence um, uh, were rather influenced by 
the writings of uh, Dr. Sigmund Freud and Bunel and Daly both uh, rep represented or reflected the, the writings of Freud in the work. Coming to sur surrealism again, surrealism is based on the belief in the superior reality of certain forms of previously neglected associations in the omnipotence of dream and in the disinterested play of thought. That is what André Breton defined or explained that as. Uh, Delhi's fascination with juxtaposing images can be exemplified by his painting Telephone and the Lobster. Delhi was always fascinated by the image of lobster and how suddenly lobster can find its way on a, a, in most unexpected places. So, he also designed uh, famously for various uh, uh, couturists in France okay, and where lobsters would be painted or be pr printed on beautiful uh, fashion gowns. And also um, there is a scene where uh, the telephone receiver is painted in the image of a lobster and how do these two go together when the idea is juxtaposition of seemingly different images. You know to move us, to shake us out of our complacency and make us uh, think, look at things uh, in a different way. The surrealism as an art was influenced by Freud, um, by the teachings or, or the writings of Freud and dedicated to the expression of imagination as revealed in dreams free of conscious control of reason and free of convention. At its core surrealism is an expression of imagination. It is different from expressionism, we need to understand that which uh, is another key uh, device or theory we t keep talking about. Expressionism is different from surrealism because it is a general term for a mode of um, representation in visual arts which is uh, uh, which is used in extreme reaction against realism or naturalism and presents a world violently distorted under the pressure of intense personal moods, ideas and emotions. So, that is where the two differ. Okay, uh, expressionism is quite violent. Okay. Image and language express feelings and imagination rather than represent external reality. Expression, expressionism is more a mood, an idea or con emotion conveyed about a certain subject matter. I would uh, suggest that you watch uh, the opening shot of Asia on the Law, uh, which was released in 1928. It is known for its non-narrative structure and surrealism and the movie famously opens with a close up sh uh, shot of a, of a woman's eye, that is what we are led to believe that it is a woman's eye and a hand holding a uh, razor, razor blade and then the blade splices the eyeball of that woman. Now, uh, this uh, scene was so, uh, this image was so shocking that people were shaken out of uh, their uh, uh, you know they were completely on the edge of their seats. I mean what is this supposed to mean? What was Bunel and rather what were Bunel and Daly trying to suggest here? Okay. I would uh, recommend that there is plenty of interpretation of this particular scene. Many people have seen it as uh, um, the young artists Bunel and Daly's uh, effort to shake the bourgeoisie out of their complacency and also to force them to look at cinema uh, as a kind of high art, not just a means of entertainment. There are other shocking imageries and images and scenes as well. For example, the scene of a severed hand and with uh, worms and ants crawling all over it and uh, a, a very uh, expressionistic winding staircase. So, these are the scenes that make us think that uh, what actually is the uh, meaning of reality, what is reality and what is the subconscious. 
Um, Vinil also made uh, a famous film, a quite a successful film called The Age of Gold, Lash Daur, which was released in 1930 and it was called generally labeled as a surrealist frenzy. Again, it is subversive and it is anarchic. It uh, looks at various ideas, sex, religion, society in uh, a very subversive and interrogative way. Bunel's characters, you know all the directors are known for uh, uh, their uh, leanings towards certain kinds, representation of certain kinds of characters and Bunel's characters are, is, are essentially hypocritical and selfish and they compromise any principle in order to find instant gratification. One example is Belle de Jour, which was released in 1967 starring uh, Catherine Deneuve and Jean Sorel, um, which is uh, a movie about unfulfilled desires, sadomasochism and again as characteristic of Bunel, um, it is a blend of reality, fantasy and dreams. I will, uh, so uh, Belle de Jour is a uh, a very well documented film. Many of you would be, I mean I suggest that uh, if you have not watched the movie then you please do watch at least clippings of the films, they are available on the net and um, I would talk, like to talk to you about uh, um, an equally great film of Bunel which uh, um, should be done in a course like this, so which is called Viridiana. Now, Viridiana uh, was released in 1961. It won several festival prizes and uh, represented Bunel's return to Spain after decades overseas. Um, it is a plot, it is a story of a young girl, Viridiana, played by Silvia uh, Penal, who is a uh, is a devoy. She is a devout person, a devout Christian, a saintly character who attempts to lead a truly Christian life and ends, how she ends in disaster for herself and people around her. Um, she is a young girl in the beginning and she is about to enter a convent, but just before this she is advised by her mother to visit an elderly uncle who lives in the countryside. Now, the uh, on seeing the young girl, the uncle uh, is uh, you know forced to remember, he recalls his dead wife who died on their wedding night. So, he, uh, the uncle drugs her and puts her in the wedding gown of his deceased wife and tries to rape her. Um, however, uh, somehow she uh, that act does not take place, but uh, later on we find that the uncle has hanged himself to his death using a jump rope. Now, Viridiana holds herself responsible, she is guilty you know like a true Christian, she feels tremendously responsible for this uh, horrible tragedy and she takes responsibility for her uncle's suicide and decides to stay back to take care of her uncle's estate along with uh, her uncle's illegitimate son, George. So, um, to continue her act of contrition, repentance, she invites a group of diseased beggars from a nearby town to come and live on her uncle's cot uh, estate. You know, there are several abandoned cottages, nobody is using them. So, she come, uh, invites these people, the homeless, the destitutes, the lepers to come and stay on the estate. There is a famous montage where we see Viridiana's futile attempts to save these wretched characters through prayers and George's efforts to restore some kind of order and balance on the estate. One day George and Viridiana are away on some business um, and uh, the beggars take over. They break into the mansion and stage a sort of parody of uh, Leonardo da Vinci's painting The Last Supper. 
Um, I am sure most of you are aware of that, but if you are not, please do look up this painting, The Last Supper by Da Vinci. Now, this scene in Bunel, okay, there is, it is like a freeze, it is uh, the beggars arrange themselves around the dining table and they have their meals exactly the way it is shown in The Last Supper, accompanied by the strains of Handel's, the classical musicians, his symphony Messiah. And uh, once Viridiana and George return, uh, one of the lepers nearly rape Viridiana. All this finally leads to the breakdown of her spiritual pride. The film was riotous and blasphemous and not surprisingly, the Spanish government attempted to destroy all the prints of the films. However, the film had already reached Cannes Film Festival and was award, awarded Palm d'Or Award. The theme is uh, something that, it ha that has been a regular in Bunel. It exposes the follies of human nature. Human beings, as Bunel says or suggests, are beyond redemption. That is his theme. And then the film is also read as an anti Catholic and anti fascist parable that Bunel shot in Catholic Spain. The film was officially denounced by the Vatican uh, and I quote them as an insult to Christianity. Bunel's The Exterminating Angel, a 1962 mo movie, is a macabre comedy. Um, it is again uh, quite anti bourgeoisie, a, a repeated, uh, a theme which, which was repeated very frequently in Bunel. So, the story takes place in a beautiful mansion, uh, a big aristocratic house where the dinner guests arrive and they arrive twice. So, same scene is repeated twice. Why? We will look into it, we will look at it. They ascend the stairs and walk through the white doorway and then they arrive again. It is a supremely crafted scene. The dinner guests arrive, they ascend the stairs walk through the white doorway and then they arrive again. The same guests seen uh, from a higher camera angle and then again they uh, ascend the stairs and walk through the wide doorway. Soon we realize um, after the initial niceties and pleasantries are exchanged, um, we realize that the cook and all the servants, the waiter, they quit their jobs and just leave, leaving the uh, owner, the mistress of the house high and dry. What is she going to, how is she going to manage this event without the aid of her servants? Now, soon we realize that the guests are all are capable, incapable of leaving, while the servants have escaped, the guests are sort of trapped in the house and it is all mysterious, it is not, there is no supernaturalism happening here there is no explanation given here, they are just not uh, able to leave the place. So, gradually uh, their well cultivated mass, the civilized mass start slipping away, they resort to slandering each other and reflect baser human emotions such as greed, lust and jealousy. They keep on getting desperate they try to get out, but cannot and then they become increasingly savage like our uh, you know primal selves. They smash furniture around the house, they start killing each other and also kill the sheep wandering into the halls. Now, what is, uh, what are sheep doing around the house? That is also left unexplained, but they kill the sheep cook them on a fire made from broken furniture. We realize they cannot wash, they are filthy, they stink, there are no toilet facilities. And when an old man dies and two lovers commit suicide, these guests, these civilized guests stuff the corpses into a closet for future use and it is hinted that uh, the supply of sheep has run out and we know what, how they are going to sustain themselves now. 
The prisoners finally attempt to reconstruct the circumstances leading up to their imprisonment, imprisonment and they are able to get out. So, again it is a story of a bourgeois cul de sac, this kind, this up, the upper class has reached a stagnation point, a dead end, there is no escaping for them. Although they have defeated the workers, the rich are trapped in their own wealth. The film, the last scene of the film is set in a cathedral, where uh, um, these people who have just escaped from this mansion, they come together and pray, offer thanks. However, the entire congregation finds itself unable to leave the church and a flock of sheep suddenly enters the building and that is the way the movie ends. So, again this is uh, an example of Bunel's scathing attack on the middle class, on the upper class of his society of the Spanish world. Uh, a gentler approach is still a satire, but a gentler approach to attacking the bourgeoisie is seen in Bunel's The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie in 1972. The film is a French language film starring Fernando Rey, who uh, was a regular of Bunel. Fernando Rey is also the character of a frog in uh, William Friedkin's The French Connection. He is the man who, who smuggles drugs in, in America. So, uh, you know, people would uh, re recall there were some kind of you know, association. So, he was a, 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 a star of international stature. It also starred Jean Pierre Castle and Stephen Audra. It won the Oscar as best foreign film and uh, it has screenplay by Jean Claude Carrier. Now, why am I telling you these names? Because as students of film appreciation, it is important that you realize or that you uh, come to appreciate these names. Okay? Jean Claude Carrier is a phenomenal screenwriter. Some of you who may be interested in the art of screenwriting would know that he has penned several screenplays for uh, um, uh, many great films. Belle de Jour was also written by him and so was The Unbearable Lightness of Being, which was made um, in the 1980s, late 1980s starring Daniel De Lewis and it is based on Milan Kundera's uh, novel, the same name. Now, a brief background to the discrete charms of the bourgeoisie. It was made at a time when social unrest um, globally was at its height. We had the Vietnam War, students unrest and forces of counterculture interrogating the western society. This was also a period when the upper middle class, the bourgeoisie was a fashionable target of disdain. I keep talking about uh, Jack Nicholson's Five Easy Pieces. You must watch this film. It was released around the same time, and again you can see uh, the the uh, the leading man, the protagonist, um, you know, contemptuous attitude towards the upper class in which he is born. Um, so the discreet charms is considered as a worthy successor to the exterminating angel. Along the same lines, how bourgeoisie have reached the dead end cul de sac, but it is gentler in its satiric bite. It is a, a satire about the foibles and the follies of the privileged class. It is extended rather as a, a, as a, a structured as an extended dream in the subconscious of uh, Don Rafael, the ambassador to France from the Latin American country of Miranda, which is a shown, which is shown as a fascist military dictatorship. Don Rafael's dream, which includes the dreams of others and dreams within dreams concern so the repeatedly frustrated attempts of six friends to dine together in a civilized way. So, food is a symbol. Now, see in the, uh, the exterminating angel, the guests were unable to escape. In the discreet charms of the bourgeoisie, these six friends, charming, civilized, gentle friends, a uh, gentle in the sense that uh, you know the ladies and gentlemen of uh, high society, 
they are unable to sit down and have a civilized meal. There are repeated attempts to do so, but all the attempts are frustrated. Food becomes a major symbol. So, dinner is the central social rich ritual. Generally, we see in the upper class, food is displayed as a way of exhibiting one's good manners, taste, class and wealth, something that they can talk about, talk over. Okay. Again, uh, so using food as an imagery and uh, satirizing the upper class. The movie as I have already told you, it exists in a dream like, it is structured in a dream like state. It has multiple dreams and fantasies and the distinction between the real and the unreal is question. Several scenes are repeated and with a good reason. So, um, uh, it is repetition is used here as an aesthetic device, you know. Uh, repetition is one uh, aesthetic device in literature and film to explore a certain state of mind. Um, I would suggest here that you watch Groundhog Day. Okay, in order to understand the uh, aesthetic device, repetition as an aesthetic device. So, Bunel feels that repetition is fundamental to human experience and uh, it can be used to explore certain human uh, uh, functioning of the human mind. So, um, from here we move on to Bunel's another great movie, The Phantom of Liberty, which was a social satire made in 1974. Uh, it is um, Bunel experiments a lot. It is a free form, free flowing film, interconnected stories and he combines every possible storytelling device including narrative painting, the gothic mood, the epistolary device, the flashback, the dream sequence and allusion to other films to create a narrative which is circular and self reflexive. Vinel's next great film was that object, that obscure object of desire released in 1977, which interrogates the theme of love and desire. It is about a young Spanish woman who flirts and then swindles a middle aged French widower. Very interestingly and again um, in continuation with Vinel's iconoclasm. Uh, a terrorist group is named the Revolutionary Army of the Infant Jesus. Uh, I have been talking about the self reflexivity and circularity of uh, narration in Bunel's films. Uh, there is also uh, uh, much that can be said about his influence on younger filmmakers. Now, see in Belle de Jour. There is a, a famous scene where Catherine Deneuve, who plays a prostitute by day, she uh, opens a box which is given to her by one of her clients and we never uh, get to know what is in the box. So, this conceit was repeated famously by Tarantino in Pulp Fiction. John Travolta opens a box and we do not know what is in the box. Again, Cohen brothers Barton Fink use the same idea, Barton Fink in 91, there is a box, but we do not know what it is. David Lynch's Mulholland Drive 2 resorts to this, what is in the box and there is a key which is left up there, you know, we it is up to us to find out what is in the box. So, when uh, Bunel was asked what is in the box in Belle de Jour, he nonchalantly answered anything you want. Okay, open ended. So, beginning of uh, you know a modernist and a beginning of postmodernism, it is whatever you want to know, want there to be. Now, um, I have spoken at length about uh, Bunel and to wind up this session, I would just quickly refer to the new Spanish cinema, one of the major filmmaker of this period is Guillermo del Toro. He is known for his Spanish language dark fantasy pieces such as the gothic horror film The Devil's Backbone and uh, 
a renowned movie Pan's Labyrinth. He has also made American action movies such as Blade Part 2 and Hellboy. His science fiction monster film Pacific Rim is also quite famous and his most recent film is The Haunted Mission is starring Ryan, Ryan Gosling. One of the most important filmmaker on uh, contemporary scene is Pedro Almodovar again from Spain. He is known for his perverse and wild, wildly funny films. He is one of the most well known Spanish directors without a doubt in recent times and his great films are Kika, Matador, High Heels, Labyrinth of Passion, A Tame, Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, All About My Mother which is also you know it has echoes of a streetcar named Desire. Almodovar's cinema bears the stamp of Ing um, Ingmar Bergman, Woody Allen and also Fessbinder, the German filmmaker Rainer Werner Fessbinder. His un unmistakable style ensures that he will be the most famous. He is indeed the most famous Spanish filmmaker next to Louis Binel. So, in conclusion what is what do we realize that Spanish cinema remains unique for its distinctive blend of darkness and surrealistic style. You watch films ranging from Bunel cinema and then you come down to films like Pan's Labyrinth, A Tame and you find uh, there is a distinct element of darkness and surrealism there. Okay, so, extremely interesting things happening there in Spanish cinema. So, thank you very much. We meet for our next class.